So hello everyone and thank you for being here with us today at KubeCon 2023. Our talk is about hardening Kubeflow security for enterprises. I'm Diana Tanasova, a software engineer at VMware's open source program office and I'm currently contributing to the Kubeflow project. Today I have the pleasure to co-present together with Julius von Kohert, who is a freelancer, a DHL employee and who is contributing to the Qflow ecosystem for over two years. And he is also a, Cube, a founder of the Qflow Security Working Group. So that's enough for us. Or do you want yeah, to say actually, something? I would like to know how many of you are actually using Qflow. Could you raise your hand, please? Hmm? Okay. Quite a few. And OK, maybe here. And how many of you are planning to use Qflow? Okay, hey, really, the remaining part. Everybody got their hands up. Amazing. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, we still will do, uh, here is the agenda, so we will still do an overview of what q project is, and we will try to share uh, the answers of who is using it and why. Uh, then, we will do a short introduction of the security working group. We will share its main goals and initiatives. Then, it, to make sure that we are on the same page, we will do an overview of the Qflow architecture, and then we will share, um, we will discuss the authentication flow of Kubernetes, of uh, Qflow. Then follows the interesting part. We will have a discussion of different various Qflow security issues, and we will end up with a conclusion. We will wrap it up. So what is Qflow? Qflow is an open source machine learning operation platform based on Kubernetes. It enables data scientists and machine learning engineers to build, scale, deploy, orchestrate their machine learning workflows. It tries to standardize and automate the iterative nature of machine learning workflow. We can see Qflow as uh, an orchestrator of commonly used machine learning platforms uh, like uh, Qflow pipelines, which are uh, reusable, modular, can be shared across uh, teams. Mm, you can do hyperparameter tuning thanks to the CATIP component. You can surf your model right in the Qflow thanks to the KSERF component. Users can spin up their favorite IDEs. They can do, um, they can easily track their lineage of uh, their pipelines and models and etc. The Kubeflow is, uh, it comprises of different components and um, it also has uh, integration with uh, different machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch and very important is that it abstracts away the complexity of Kubernetes. So to summarize, um, Kubeflow helps teams to streamline their, uh, pro their work. It improves the collaboration. It has, it has a multi-tenancy support. And uh, as a whole, it speeds up the, the time for uh, developing their models. So uh, the the project is developed by uh, numerous uh, companies, and now the project is doing its next step, step towards joining CNCF, incubate CNCF landscape as an incubating project. We hope that this will happen soon. I would like to announce that uh, Kubeflow version 1.7 has been just released. So if you still haven't tried, uh, if you still haven't tried, please do. So who is using Kubeflow and why? Companies from various uh, industries are using Qflow, like uh, communication, finance, medical, insurance, and especially the regulated sector. But also some hyperscalers are using Qflow, like IBM, Google, VMware, DHL, Aricto, and others. Actually, Googles are using Qflow as their default, default machine learning platform on GCP under the name Vertex AI. But why Qflow is a platform of choice for so many users? Uh, simple, there is no similar open source uh, machine learning orchestration alternative avail available. And 
Another reason for adopting Q4, especially for regulated sector, but not only, is that it's vendor neutral, it's scalable, standardized, and we could say fairly secure. So we have the similar, the similar reasons for adopting Q4 on enterprises as running Kubernetes on enterprises. So now let's say a few words about the newly formed security working group, uh, which technical leader is uh, uh, Julius. Its primary goal is to define a clear policies and procedures on how vulnerabilities should be uh, reported and should be publicly disclosed. Another uh, goal is to enforce the use of security best practices, like automate every API call, like use the least privileges airbag, do periodic CV scanning, and now still uh, in progress is the integration of uh, software build of materials or SBOMs. Of course, these groups provide place for discussions during our bi-weekly meetings and uh, in Slack. And of course, the main focus of this group is to tackle different uh, security related issues. Uh, in the following slides, uh, we will discuss some of these issues. So now we would like to share some of the insights we got from our first CV scanning, starting from 1.7 Q4, uh, Q4 version. So this table contains information about the number of images used uh, by a specific group and the number of CVs divided by severity. Luckily, most of these uh, CVs here originate from our external dependencies, and the majority of them can be addressed by just upgrading to a newer version. Uh, actually, Canonical already worked towards uh, minimizing these numbers, and uh, they have even achieved um, zero critical and zero high CV, uh, high severity CVEs. So we're expecting their work to be contributed upstream. So it's important to take care for your dependency. We automatically inherit all their books and CVEs. And now still work in progress, the community is doing its next step towards um, securing software supply chain by integrating software view of materials or SBOMs. SBOM provides an exhaustive list of all the software components within the project with their versions and their licenses in standardized format. So both sides and once this, uh, and once this uh, file SBOM files is released, both sides, the users community and the contributors community could benefit as it provides transparency. Both sides knows what are the ingredients within the project in this specific version of the project. And it increases the accountability. Based on these CV files, so you could do a, a CV scanning. And we could say that um, it enables us to do accurate uh, identification and remediation of uh, security vulnerabilities. And I forgot to say that ensures that the project, the project is license compliant. Now, Julius. Yes, thank you very much. Is this working? Yes. So uh, let's start with the architecture here. And please, yeah, my voice is, please follow closely because this is important for the remaining part of the presentation. Yeah. So we start with the architecture here. In yellow, we can see the authentication and authorization part within Kubeflow, um, consisting of an ingress gateway, Dexter's ODC provider, the internal ODC service, and in general, a service mesh. Actually, the service mesh, as well as certificate manager, is connected to most components within Kubeflow. I'm not going to cover it everywhere. Yeah? But giving this authentication and authorization part, oh yes, amazing. Um, let's first take a look from the user side here, because usually you have quite a lot of users, in this case, user X, uh, which owns a project or namespace or profile, however you want to call it. Um, why do we do this interchangeably? Because we have these profile controllers here, which actually pick up a Kubeflow profile custom resource and transforms it into a Kubernetes namespace, adds some default service account, role bindings, secrets, and so on. So yeah, this is done for all of your users automatically. For example, I run some clusters which have several hundred users. Then, giving this, we have the central dashboard here, 
in Ray, which is connected to most of the Kubeflow UI components. So this is the main entry point for the user. As for example, Volume UI, which is quite simple. It just allows you to manage your own PPCs in your namespace because, as I said before, this is really just a Kubernetes namespace with some additions. So you can do all the normal Kubernetes stuff as well there in your Kubeflow namespace. But then comes the probably most used Kubeflow component, which is Kubeflow pipelines, which adds some quite some resources to the cluster in the Kubeflow namespace and allows the user to run these reusable modular pipelines we talked earlier about in their own namespaces. This is heavily used, developed by Google. This is their main product, also sold as Vertex AI on the GCP platform. And then we have KTIP, as said before, for hyperparameter tuning here in green. Um, and also quite heavily used, the workbenches, formerly called notebooks. As the name already says, you can start your Jupyter Lab, Visual Studio Code, R Studio, later on maybe also Label Studio and MLflow within these uh, as in a self-service manner. To, so you can just point and click, choose how many GPUs, memory CPU you want, and start your online IDE. And last but not least, there's KSurf here in pink, um, which is used for model serving. I think there was a talk a few hours ago here, exactly in this room from Bloomberg about KSERF and how they use it. Um, yeah, it's using Knative under the hood, so that means you get serverless inferencing, you get scale to zero and some nice additional stuff. And all of this, as you can see here, runs in the user namespace. The actual workload is always running in the user namespaces, so you can add your quotas and whatever onto it. Then we have the Kubeflow namespace, which covers most of these components and is the system and authorization for these here. This is the big picture of Kubeflow, but it's not complete because, for example, I'm working with AnyScale on Ray integration. Maybe you know Ray, the training platform for ChatGPT, as well as MLflow integration, Label Studio integration, and so on. So there's a lot to add to Kubeflow. It's really a big orchestration platform for quite a few frameworks. Now, try to remember, but I'm always going to show it again. <laughs> so, um, for authentication, I'm giving back to Yana again? I'm not sure that everybody hears you. Yes. Do you hear him? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So now on this slide, we would like uh, to show you the authentication flow, flow of Kubernetes, of uh, Kubeflow. So it starts with a user or a machine who needs access uh, to uh, Kubeflow. So the user hits the ingress uh, gateway, which redirects uh, the request and ask another service, OIDC auth service, to validate the request. Currently, we do support uh, two kinds uh, of authentication, session-based, for intended for humans, and what's new in 1.7 is that we do support service account-based authentication. So, OIDC service validates the request. Uh, the request is valid if it contains headers with a valid token or a valid session. If they're missing or they are not valid, it uh, redirects the user towards uh, to begin a new cycle of OI OIDC uh, authentication to, up to, con to up get the session. So once the request is valid and it has a valid session cookie and a service account token, the OIDC service also adds another new header called user ID header. So, and then the request is actually redirected to the correct Kubeflow component. This new header, user ID header, is later used by the Kubeflow components for authorization. So, before 1.7, the OIDC service uh, supported only the interactive session intended for humans. So we were supposed to simulate the web browsers for machines. And now with the newer 1.7 version, we had a, problem, a programmatic way to authenticate the uh, machines using the service account tokens. And now I will give the stage to... Actually, this was a quite heavily requested feature by the user. Okay, actually this was a quite heavily requested feature by the users because quite a lot of companies are using GitHub workflows 
uh, GitLab pipelines to trigger Kubeflow pipelines in turn, and they definitely need a long-term uh, proper machine-to-machine -machine authentication. So this now, in 107, it's in. And let's continue with what we've achieved so far. Because I'm not only talking about the bad security stuff, I also want to talk about what we've done so far. And it's actually quite a lot. Because, um, yeah, we had some problems over the last few years. And this started with misconfiguration of Istio sidecar services and so on, um, which allowed you to easily fake the user ID header and impersonate to a lot of services which you have seen before in the architectural overview. And you could just fake to be another user, hijack their namespaces, and so on. Of course, completely unacceptable in an enterprise environment. And yeah, even the user management itself was completely unprotected a year ago. So yeah, you could just add yourself to any other user's namespaces, hijack it, take it over, and so on. Yeah, complete disaster. OK, but I spent some time on it with some other persons as well. And we fixed these issues upstream. Everything is contributed. We spent some time to harden Istio with security best practices, yeah? add additional sidecars, and so on. And in addition to Istio authorization policies, I later on also added network policies as a second layer of defense. And actually, it turned out to be quite valuable and catch some additional Istio misconfiguration. So, <laughs> Please, it's under the content folder. If you use Kubeflow, please consider using the network policies as well. So this is regarding Istio network policies, quite some changes, quite some improvements. And another area where we made significant progress over the last two years here are rootless containers. And as probably all of you know, it's still an unnecessary security risk. You shall not run root containers nowhere, never if possible. Yeah? although some people still do it. Um, so this is obviously even with Kubernetes user namespaces, which is something you might know about, improving the situation about root and so on. But even despite such efforts in the Kubernetes Foundation, it's still a big problem and it's forbidden by most company policies. In say, in enterprise environments, you don't want to have your users to run root containers. Yeah, it's quite simple. So. But what's the default situation within Kubeflow? If you go to the Kubeflow website, download the manifest, install in your cluster, and so on, then by default, almost all of your containers run as root, especially in the user-controlled namespaces, which makes it easier to exploit your cluster, escalate privileges, and so on. So this is something I wanted to get rid almost two years ago, one of the first, thing I, first things I tackled. So we made it possible to run 99% rootless. Yeah, of course, you're asking, where's this 1% gone? It's gone within the Istio C9 daemon set. Because if you want to run Istio rootless, um, this is the only supported option at the moment. So you want rootless init containers, no admin rights there. You want to prevent root containers everywhere. You have to use Istio C9. This is where the 1% is going. And you will get an exception for this probably at your company. Huh? And then it's not enough to just um, do this for all default containers, which are there in the Kubeflow namespace, in the Istio minus system namespace, and so on. But you also have to enforce it for new containers that you probably do not know at installation time, because your users can bring their own containers in their Kubeflow namespaces, their own containers for pipeline training, their own containers for inferencing, and so on. So you have to enforce this on the cluster level, on the Kubernetes level, by using pod security policies. And nowadays, I think with Kubernetes 1.25, you can use pod security standards, which is the successor of pod security policies as well. So um, this solves the rootless container issue, but there's one limitation, because some people do not use GitLab pipelines or GitHub workflows to build their containers or something else, but they actually want to build containers in their own Kubeflow namespace. And this is slightly limited because, of course, no legacy insecure Docker, but even with Podman or Canico, it's not, still not yet possible to build OCI containers rootless. This is the only limitation so far, except for this significant security gain. Please use this at, at your company. I'm linking the GitHub pull request there. 
and I'm hoping to upstream this all of this in the near future. So the second thing, rootless containers mostly fall. Um, yeah, then let's go to the exploit part. Yeah. Let's start with a simple example. This is just a simple RBAC issue. Yeah, most of you should be somewhat familiar with RBAC stuff. I hope you can hear me properly. If not, please raise your hand. Okay. <coughs> then, yeah, let's start again. We have a namespace called Alice because I think this is common in the security sector that you call them Alice and Bob. So I took this here as well. So we have Alice and Bob here. And we have the Kubeflow namespace. And in the Kubeflow namespace, those two controllers, controllers run, which you've seen before in the architecture overview. There's first of all, the profile controller, which takes these Kubeflow profile custom resources and transforms them into namespaces, add some stuff, wall bindings, authorization policies, and so on. But then there's a second one. Yeah? Not only this one, the normal profile controller, also, the pipeline profile controller from Google, yeah, they were developed independently. So this one here as well, add some additional stuff just for Kubeflow pipelines to the namespace, as you can see here on this side. So now that we have these controllers, what's the problem with them? Yeah? Obviously, as you would have expected, they both just run as cluster admin, <laughs> as you can see here which should never be the case, never provide cluster admin roles to any of your service accounts. It's just, don't do it. Um, because then one exploit in the Kubeflow namespace and you can easily become cluster admin. Yeah? That's the problem. It's just about hardening in this case. Yeah? So what can we do? Should of course be a reduced cluster role and if possible talk to the Google developers to merge all of this into one profile controller to reduce complexity and therefore attack surface. So this is a quite simple example, rather on the side, not that big impact yet, but we can get to a more sophisticated one that includes namespace sharing. Because if you have tried Kubeflow so far by yourself, you will have probably noticed that you can share your namespace with collaborators. Um, we start again, we have Alice and Bob, in this case malicious Alice, <coughs> who gets added to Bob's namespace as a collaborator. So what does this mean? Um, she also will have access to the um, service accounts here in Bob's namespace. And this is problematic on several levels because first of all, um, it does work. Yes, you can access Bob's Jupyter Labs, Bob's pipelines and so on. Everything is working yeah, on the surface, but it's completely broken on the Kubernetes level, at least from a security perspective, because first of all, they are configured in such a way that even if you only have access to the default viewer, you can escalate to default editor in several ways. Even with the Kubernetes 1.25 improvement, where the secrets are not created by default for service accounts, it's still possible to escalate. Yeah? So this is the first thing, even in your own namespace, you can escalate your privilege privileges to another service account with higher privileges. Should not be the case. And the other way more important problem is, just imagine Alice is malicious, malicious at a big company. So she just steals Bob's default editor service account token, leaves the company and impersonate Bob with the Vera token. She can just log into the Kubernetes cluster. I actually did this myself several times. So um, should not be the case. If you leave the company, you should not have access to any Kubernetes clusters anymore just because you stole a service account token. Yeah? And what can we do against this? For example, we can just disable sharing altogether. This is what is done at some companies because I'm doing consulting, I know about it. And then there is as well a second solution which is might, might be called a proper solution to some degree, which means actually deleting, regenerating all of these secrets, tokens, and so on. None of this is implemented yet upstream, so please take care at your companies. Yeah? This is a problem if you enable name, or if you leave the default namespace sharing enabled. <coughs> then we have an, yeah, sharing is staring. As I always say in life, be careful. So um, 
now there's another issue about multi-tenancy, especially um, the artifact storage within Kubeflow, um, which is implemented using MinIO yeah, as S3 server. And here you can see it's used mostly by Kubeflow pipelines, to some degree also by KSERF. Um, and we start again. We have Alice, we have Bob, and their namespaces. So let's add the Kubeflow pipeline components, which you have seen on the architecture slide before, here in blue. So, and as well as an additional backend stuff as the pipeline API server and MinIO. Yeah. They used, yeah, especially MinIO is accessed by most Kubeflow pipeline components. So what's the problem? It's completely shared. Yeah, these secrets, MinIO secret one and MinIO secret two, they are actually the same. And not even that, they're not just, just the same, they're also the admin secret for MinIO by default. So any user here in your Kubeflow installation can destroy your MinIO instance, yeah, can hijack other users, read all artifacts from all other users. There's just no default multi-tenancy. You just share everything and can destroy everything. So <laughs> a year ago, this is why I spent some time on a POC to isolate the artifacts per user. And in the end, really have separate folders with proper IAM permissions, which you can set in MinIO, um, such that the users cannot access each other's artifacts anymore. Uh -huh. And this is actually in place at some companies, so I'm not sure maybe it's already an implementation and not only a POC. But in the long term, I want to get even better because we still have credentials there. Just imagine now we have randomized, separate, different credentials per namespace, not the admin secret anymore. It's still annoying. You still have to pick them up as a user. And in the long term, I actually want to get, ri get rid of those credentials altogether. I want to use the namespace origin here for authorization. But this is not yet implemented for the um, POC with separate credentials. There is a PR, you can click on it. Please use it at your company. Try to contribute back if possible. And last but not least, um, the main developer of Kubeflow pipelines, which is Google, is allergic to AGPL. What does this mean? Um, they just don't allow it. And the problem is, as you may know, uh, <laughs> MinIO switched around three years ago from AGPL2 to, no, from Apache2 to AGPL. Uh, so we have a three year old MinIO image to quite a lot of CVEs, I would guess. Um, yeah, and we have to find a successor. <laughs> I'm working on that, but it's not yet upstream. So CVEs in the image and the admin credentials shared for all users quite important. This is something I think which is necessary to fix um, if you want to deploy Kubeflow. And then orthogonal to the artifact storage, there's also metadata storage for lineage, lineage tracking of your artifacts, especially the metadata for pipeline one artifacts. Yeah? It's also heavily used by TensorFlow. So the Google guys decided to also use it within Kubeflow. Um, and we start again, we have Alice and Bob with the namespaces and add a lot of components for this ML metadata stuff. I'm not going into detail about this, but the main problem is again, we don't have multi-tenancy support. Yeah? It's again, similar to the artifacts, it's shared for all users. Yeah? Alice can access Bob's metadata. So there's a solution for it. Currently, you can just disable this component of Kubeflow because it's quite modular. This is what I do at most companies. Um, but the problem is the newer version of Kubeflow pipelines might require the machine learning metadata part and then it becomes complicated. We will have to spend some time on isolating it per user for KFP version two. I talked to the Google guys, they are focusing on it for the second half of the year. Let's hope they deliver, but let's see. And of course, we are looking for volunteers, yeah? Not just for this issue, but for any issue. I'm really offering mentorships. I did my third mentorship already. Um, if you want to contribute, just contact me. I'm going to help for free just to improve the project here. And then to add some variety, we also have a front-end issue for you. Um, as you can see here, just imagine, this is Bob's namespace. 
um, he had a just the bottom of the UI. <laughs> and just imagine he did some TensorFlow training in a cool, shiny little pipeline. And the TensorFlow training produced some output artifacts, as you can see here or at the bottom. This is the S3 path, including a namespace parameter. Now, the problem is that if Alice somehow manages to spy, to spy Bob's S3 artifact file path, then the UI allows, allows Alice to actually read the content. Yeah? How does this work? You just remove the namespace param parameter here, enter this in your web browser, and the UI will not check permissions. Someone forget to add the permission check. <laughs> this is still the case in the default installation um, from Google. And there's also some additional technical depth that, for example, yes, we skip the API server, we access Mineo directly, or the artifact proxy, which you've seen before on the slides, is also rather obsolete. So there is some stuff to be done on the especially in Kubeflow pipelines regarding the artifact storage as well as the metadata storage. So then there's also an additional uh, denial of service attack. And I know some companies who are really affected by this. Yeah, you can block the usage of the cluster for or at least the database and therefore KFP for most users. Um, I'm not going to explain it here. Please, if you want to help us, fix this. It's just SQL stuff. Join us, and uh, we will find a solution for this. Yeah, so as a conclusion, we achieved quite a lot over the last two years, like authentication for most API calls, lower privilege RBAC. Yeah. We also founded a security working group, including the just recently released image scanning numbers, um, software bill of materials, the new machine-to-machine -machine authentication. Yeah. Um, Istio improvements, network policies, and of course, rootless containers. But yeah, on the other hand, we still have some open issues, which I've just presented here from the profile controllers and namespace sharing, which are mostly RBAC related to the multi-tenancy support within Kubeflow pipelines, the artifact storage and metadata, yeah, does not support it yet properly. And we, prov we have provided some solutions to some of those issues here. Um, yeah, this is what I would like to summarize. And of course, please join us. As said several times before, we're looking for volunteers. Um, you can join the community. There's a community calendar. You can join us on Slack. Um, quite responsive. There's a security channel on Slack. And we have the security working group meeting uh, minutes. So you can even see what we've done so far in videos. Yeah. This is our contact information. Please do not refrain to contact us. Um, I will try to answer you as fast as possible. And we would really like you to rate our talks such that we can improve on your feedback. So I know this is quite a lot. It's not an entry level presentation, but maybe some people already have some knowledge regarding <laughs> okay, maybe some people already have some knowledge regarding Kubeflow, want to, yeah, get a more in-detail explanation of some of the issues I've been shown here. Any questions so far? Yes, please. Ah, yeah. Is there any work going on, like, isolating? <laughs> I will try. Yeah. Is there any work going on isolating or, like, uh, managing security of the notebooks. So let's say if I am in a notebook, I can authenticate in the notebook via my credentials. And within the team, any member can have my credentials. So that is one of the security issues that we are facing in our company. Yes, if you share your namespace with other users, then of course they will have access to the same stuff. I wouldn't call this an exploit. So if you really want to separate this, maybe create separate namespaces per user and one big shared one. But it's not really an exploit if you explicitly share the namespace and then expect some stuff to not be shared. I mean, I understand regarding the exploits of default editor, a viewer to editor, this is clear, but um, at least at most of the companies I know, they just have per user namespaces and if they then work as a department within a project, then usually these 
departments get their own shared namespace where all of the department users are inside and they know they are sharing stuff. Okay, okay thank you. Yes, could you hand over the microphone? Thank you very much. Cool, hi. So uh, I was wondering, did you ever consider integrating with um, other open source tools like Gatekeeper, um, OPA policies? So for instance, um, how the way KFP um, pipelines work, the V1 version is that you create like a workflow and then uh, it gets turned into a uh, pipeline execution. So one um, way I solve multi-tenancy is that I build a OPA policy that prevents running other people's pipelines. Can you get a bit closer to the mic? Oh, yeah, sure. So the way I solved uh, one of the multi-tenancy issues is that um, in the like previous versions, you would uh, be able to run other people's pipelines. So I built a policy that prevents you running other people's pipelines only in the namespaces that you whitelisted it. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you like considered integrating with um, OPA policies and Gatekeeper. So f no, not yet so far, um, because I think if I've understood your question correctly, then you are talking about namespace sharing and then uh, like pipeline execution. So you can in the previous versions you were able to execute other people's pipelines. Ah, yes. Okay, now I know what you're talking about. Yes, this is too much to cover here, but I can tell you a lot about it. Um, you had these, um, I think even in Kubeflow 1.7, you still have just the shared pipelines displayed in the user interface. Yes. Yeah. And also on the MinIO level, they are stored and you can access them even there and you can probably also access them in the database. Yes, that's still possible. But um, in Kubeflow 1.8, I think this is solved. We now have a proper UI which separates between shared pipelines and private pipelines. I can also, if you come later to me, I can tell you about the exact pull request. This is actually solved. The only thing that is missing is the KFP SDK support. But um, now we have really in the UI, uh, we have um, a separation between shared or global public and private pipelines. And I even had my own implementation some time ago, but nowadays it's really fixed upstream. Okay, cool. So I'll uh, look forward for the 1.8. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> if Thanks. you want to help regarding the KFP SDK stuff, feel free to volunteer. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I will. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for doing all the work. Uh, it's very useful, so thanks. And also for the presentation, of course. Uh, my question is regarding the CVEs. Uh, you showed a quite scary table of, of vulnerabilities. And you were talking about how they were getting solved, which is very nice, of course. But I was wondering, uh, is this also going to be part of the of the release schedule that in, in the future, uh, CVEs won't be introduced into new versions, so we can use it directly? Yes, this is exactly one of the reasons why the security working group has been founded. Um, and one of, actually, it was mostly by, done by Diana here. Um, who did the security scanning. Um, yes, and we are especially working on fixing all the CVEs. I talked to Canonical, they have their booth here. Um, they fixed most of, most of them and want to upstream it. And as said before, it's mostly outdated base images. Yeah? So I think we can really get the high and critical ones to almost zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, yeah, thanks. The problem is actually it's scattered about over so many repositories. You have Kubeflow Manifest, which pulls from Kubeflow pipelines, which pulls from Kubeflow slash Kubeflow, case of, and so on. And it's quite difficult to, you have to um, manage with all of the separate working groups. You have to create separate pull requests per working group to update their base images, and then most of the CVEs should be gone. Okay. But it will take some time. Yeah, of course, I understand. But thanks anyways for the work. By the way, from which, I would like to know from which companies you are who are using Kubeflow, if you could tell us, or are you using it privately? Oh, sure. No, we're not using it yet. I'm from a local bank here in the Netherlands, the Volksbank. Um, we're not using it yet, but we were looking forward to, to being uh, looking at implementing it. Uh, but this was a very important talk, of course, uh, for us because, well, you can imagine why. <laughs> yes, I can imagine why you have, especially the regulated sectors, as I said before. Um, Yes, it's doable. I know some quite 
quite a lot of big companies, not just the ones listed here, but even way more companies, insurances, and so on. And you cannot imagine how many people are using Kubeflow, but are not contributing back. Some companies are really not allowing their employees to contribute back. Mm. So maybe this is something you should also check first, whether you are allowed to contribute to the project if you want to help fixing those issues. I think that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, having enough time for it would be the major uh, <laughs> problem, I think, because most people have. Okay, do we have any further questions here, maybe? No? Okay. And I guess we're also over time a bit, so um, if you want to talk about anything in detail, just come up front. I will be here for 10 or 15 minutes in addition. Uh, and thank you very much for your patience. I hope this uh, talk was enlightening for you <laughs> or entertaining.